share screen? Um, yes, down on the little carrot, and I will authorize you now. Let's see here, all participants. And so you should be able to share your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, are you with me now, folks? Yeah, there's nothing shared yet, though. Oh, uh, it should be a title slide. No. Okay, I didn't do something correctly. So down on the bottom, share screen. Do you have Do you have that window open on your desktop? Yeah. Yes, I do. So that should be one of the options that that shows up then when you hit that little that little green carrot on the share screen. Okay, now I get it. Okay, now can you see what we're doing here? Yes. Now you need to maximize it there from beginning. There you go. Perfect. And I'm going to mute too, Kent, and, and, and shut off my camera as well. So okay, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming and attending tonight. This is going to uh, take about an hour, probably. And we're going to talk about our monitoring program. And this particular session is training on Streamflow. I think Streamflow is very important part of water quality monitoring. And we'll hear more about that as we go along. So here's a streamflow hydrograph, hydro water graph is a graph, of course. So this is a water graph from the Quidapahilla Creek near Belgrove, PA. This is uh, 19, this is 2022, all the way up through almost the end of July, not quite. And it shows uh, where there were storms and where there was no rain to speak of. And that's what we need to have for each one of our monitoring stations. And that's what we will have if we do our work correctly. Um, as we go along, I'll tell you more about it. So our whole monitoring program includes a lot more than just stream flow. Tonight, we're talking stream flow. But as background, our components of the monitoring program include habitat and geomorphology. This is typically done by our summer intern students. Biological monitoring done by Dr. Rebecca Urban and her students at Lebanon Valley College and water quality monitoring. And that's what we'll focus on tonight. And that's done by our volunteers. And within the water quality monitoring component, we have stream flow monitoring, which we'll talk about tonight, fixed point sampling, meaning that we sample at one location over and over and over and over. And then we have some special studies that I hope we will get into eventually, uh, probably on dissolved oxygen and on temperature. Tonight, stream flow monitoring, and it's a really important part of the overall monitoring program. Here are the locations of our fixed monitoring sites. Q1 is on the Quidapahilla Creek. Q2 is farther downstream on the Quidapahilla Creek. This is, this is the town of Palmyra, just kind of half in the watershed. Here's the town of Anvil, and here's Lebanon. So this is Snitz Creek, Beck Creek, Bachman Run, Killinger Creek, all major tributaries to the Quidapahilla, and we have a monitoring station on each one of those tributaries. So here's the monitoring stations listed out, um, and you can see exactly where they are. This Snitz Creek site is at Dairy Road, for example, and we call that station number S1 and so forth. So today we're going to talk about stream flow basics. Um, but we will include definition of stream flow, why is it important and how do we measure it and what will the role be for our volunteers? So that's the overview of the session tonight. What is stream flow? It's the volume of water moving past a point during a specified period of time. So volume is measured in cubic feet and time is typically measured in seconds. If we're in Great Britain, volume is measured in cubic meters and time is still measured in seconds. So stream flow is measured in cubic feet per second or foot cube per second, or we simply uh, call it CFS, cubic feet per second. And flow is the same as the word discharge 
which is the same as the volume of water, which is typically represented by the letter Q in mathematical equations. And we'll use that a lot. So when we're talking about string flow, we're talking about the volume of water moving past a point. Why is it important? Flood forecasting, uh, NOAA, the National Weather Service, uses stream flow information to do flood forecasting. Their stream flow is used for engineering calculations like how high to build a bridge over the water. Stream flow is used for the dilution, dilution of pollution. When I was in graduate school, I had a sign on my wall that said, dilution is not the solution to pollution. But in fact, it is because it is in part because the volume of discharge that can come from a wastewater treatment plant is dependent upon the volume of water in the creek. So the creek actually serves as a dilution for the incoming pollution. Stream flow is important for calculation of loads, calculation of yields, and because of its influence on water quality, we'll talk more about those shortly. So maybe you've not heard of a TMDL. TMDL stands for Total Maximum Daily Load, TMDL. And that's the uh, device that the DEP uses to determine if a stream is impaired, or at least one of, the, one of the ways. So they calculate a daily load, daily load for the stream and sum all up all the different kinds of loads and determine what the maximum should be. And if the stream is higher than the maximum, then it is impaired. In November 2000, in November of 2000, DEP did a TMDL, a total maximum daily load study for the Quidapahilla Creek. That's an important document. And their conclusion was, quote, excessive sediment and nutrient loads have been identified as the pr primary causes of impairment. So we're talking about sediment and nutrient loads. So the Quiddy and its tributaries are listed as impaired on the Pennsylvania list of impaired streams called the 303D list. So why is stream flow important? Because we need to know stream flow in order to calculate the load. That's what we've been talking about is a load. And the load is defined as the concentration of a substance let's say phosphorus times the flow in the stream and it's abbreviated L equal C times Q. There's that Q term flow. So, so stream flow is used to measure loads. It's also used to measure yields. Yield is equal to the load divided by the drainage area. So here's the equation for that. And the importance of this is it allows a comparison of one site to another site because you're talking about per drainage area. So if we went to Snitz Creek, which is a pretty big drainage area compared to some of the others, and, and we divided the load by the drainage area, you would have the, a load that's attributed per square mile. And if we went to Bachman Run, we could do the same thing and we could compare the load per square mile for Snitz versus Bachman or any other site for that matter. So again, though, we, we, know, we need no stream flow because that's part of the load calculation. So flow also impacts water quality. Obviously higher flows carry more sediment. Higher flows dilute point source effluents. Higher flows dilute groundwater inputs. So flow, once again, is critical to knowing what's happening. Here's a little schematic representation of how the volume of water or the flow has an influence on water quality. The higher the stream flow, the higher the concentration for suspended substances. For example, sediment or anything attached to sediment. Phosphorus, we know, sorbs very tightly to sediment. So do metals, so do many organic compounds. And so for these types of contaminants, the higher the stream flow, the higher the concentration. Here's a picture to demonstrate what we all know. 
uh, higher stream flow carries more sediment than low flow. And here's a flood occurring on a farm field and a lot of sediment coming with it. So what are the implications of this? Think about determining trends in water quality. Imagine the Quidapahilla Watershed Association installs stream bank stabilization projects at three locations. We know for sure that these projects will result in a reduced sediment input from bank erosion, but we need to prove it. So we do our water quality monitoring. And what we find is that the load of sediment has not decreased at all, but has increased. Surprisingly, perhaps it is because we initially sampled at low flow following the project installations, we sampled at higher flows, which carried more sediment. So it looks like, based on our monitoring, that the sediment load incre increased. But in actuality, it's just a because the flow was higher. This is not unusual. <clears throat> Frequently in Pennsylvania, we have what we call high flow years or low flow years. And so you have to take flow into account whenever you're determining trends. So we talked about suspended substances. Now here's a schematic representation for dissolved substances. And what happens here is with these, as stream flow increases, the concentration decreases. Now that's exactly opposite of what we said for suspended substances. But indeed, this is what happens for dissolved substances like calcium, magnesium chloride, sulfate, nitrates, and also for point sources. And I'll demonstrate the point sources thing. Think about it. Let's say we have a stream. Let's say it's the Quitapela Creek. It's fed by groundwater in many places. Groundwater is high in calcium and magnesium because there's limestone in the watershed. And so the groundwater is high in calcium and magnesium compared to rainwater, which rainwater is almost pure. And so if you get a lot of rainwater that causes higher stream flow, then you'll have dilution for the calcium and magnesium. So for dissolved substances, as stream flow increases, concentration decreases. Same thing for point sources. For example, let's suppose this is a treatment plant effluent coming into the creek. You can see that if there's low flow in the creek, then the treatment plant effluent makes up a large part of the volume of flow. But if there's a rain and the flow goes higher, then the treatment plant is basically diluted. And therefore, the higher flow means the lower concentration. So let's revisit why is stream flow important. We talked about flood forecasting and engineering, and now we just talked about dilution of pollution. We talked about calculation of loads, calculation of yields, and the influence on water quality. This is what I'm trying to impress upon you tonight. Stream flow is important for water quality monitoring. And if we can get that learned tonight, then I'm very happy. So we need to measure stream flow. How do we do this? Well, stream flow is equal to the cross-sectional area times the velocity of water. Cross-section is equal to the width times the depth. We measure the width using a tag line or a tape measure. We measure the depth with a yardstick or a rod. And we measure the velocity with a velocity meter. So here's a tape measure that we measure stream width. I'm sure you folks have probably seen these things before. Here's a weighting rod with a little velocity meter attached to the bottom. And I have one of those set up here that I can show you. This gives you an idea of how tall it is, how big it is. And on the bottom of it is a little velocity meter. And this thing rotates around. And the faster the velocity of the creek, the faster it rotates. So we can measure the velocity using this device. Now I'm going to, this comes with a headset. I'm going to plug the headset in. And if everything works well, you should be able to hear it. Okay.
Can you hear that? We're getting a little click. What I did is I flipped the little velocity meter so that it rotates. And every time it makes one rotation, you hear a little click. You count the number of clicks and we have a little device that uh, indicates how, how fast the water's flowing. So that's that device. I'm gonna unplug it and set it aside. But that's a major doc, major device that we use in measuring stream flow. It's really quite tedious, but um, it's the best we got. So that's that's called a well. Let's see. There are other kinds of current meters. I showed you that one. This is a current meter from Global Water. Costs about a thousand dollars. This is two years ago when I made this slide, so it's probably more than that now. This is a little Hawk velocity meter, $6,000. Here's a price AA current meter, very similar to our little girly current meter, except it's much bigger, $835. We can't afford those. Here's our little girly pygmy current meter. See, there's a quarter, that's a for size. That's what the thing looks like, not attached to the rod. So we can measure stream velocity with this little pygmy current meter. The cost, to us was zero because it was donated from my former colleagues at the USGS. Why did they donate three of these things for us? Because they're obsolete. These days they use a Doppler type device to measure the current, more accurate, but they've used these for decades and decades. So I figure we can use them also. They won't be as accurate, but they'll be pretty good. Current meter. So. How do we measure stream flow? Imagine a stream, a perfect rectangular cross section, laminar flow. Flow is equal all, all across there. So the volume of flow is equal to the cross sectional area times the velocity. To measure the cross sectional area, simply the width times the depth. Width, depth. Let's say the width is eight feet, the depth is two feet, the cross sectional area is eight times two feet equals 16 feet squared. And then we took our little pygmy current meter and we measured the velocity and we found out that for this hypothetical situation, it's two feet per second. So the volume of flow is equal to 16 feet squared times the velocity of two feet per second equal to 32 cubic feet per second. And the, and the units come out beautifully. Everybody with me on that? So that's all fine and good, but stream cross sections are not perfectly rectangular in shape and flow is rarely laminar as in never. So we have to subdivide the stream into subsections and measure the flow of each one of the subsections. So here's a little di uh, diagram for that. <clears throat> so we measure, we divide the stream into subsections. Here's one, two, three, four, and so on all the way across the stream. And in each subsection, we measure the depth times the width, which would be the cross-sectional area. And we measure the velocity and we multiply the area times the velocity. And we get the flow for that little subsection only. But we do all the individual subsections and sum them to get a total volume of flow. So it's like dividing the stream into little components. So in, in the field, we would determine the width of the stream. We'd use our tape measure to do that or a tag line. We'd divide the stream into 10 equal width sections, determine the width of each section, measure the depth of each section at the center point of the section, measure the velocity at 6 tenths of the depth for each section, and by the way, this little meter that I just showed you, the rod that I showed you, has a little device that'll help you determine exactly where to set your velocity meter at six tenths of the depth. And then you calculate the flow for each section and the flow of course equal to cross sectional area times the velocity, sum the flow for all these sections to get a total flow. So um, Trip McGarvey has made a little uh, Microsoft Excel program to do these calculations for us. All we have to do is put in the raw numbers and, and, we'll, and uh, the uh, 
program will pop out a total volume of flow. So the reason we do it six tenths of the depth is because the velocity of a stream is different at water surface. It's different from it is on the bottom. There's um, uh, rocks and things that impede the flow at the bottom. And so the higher velocity is at the top of the stream, the, the surface. So six tenths of the depth is right there. Uh, and that's where we would measure the flow. Except, um, here's, a, here's an example. Suppose the depth is eight tenths of a foot. Six tenths of the depth is 0.6 times 0.8 or 0.48 foot. So we set the velocity meter at 0.48 feet. And this, this rod is called a top set rod. So we have a little device here that allows us to, to move the meter up and down. Uh, you just push in this little um, button and you can raise the meter, you can raise the meter up high, yeah, punch a hole in the ceiling. So, and you can lower the meter as needed. So there are really two, two parts of this thing. I, I, and I'm not able to demonstrate it here very well because of the ceiling. But that little device will help a lot. So if we set the meter to 0.48 feet in this example, but for a section of stream that's greater than two feet deep, we measure the velocity at two tenths the depth and at eight tenths the depth and average the two velocity readings. And there's a little example, which we don't need to go through. So if it's a deeper stream, we want to get a better reading and we go at two tenths, two tenths and eight tenths. And there's again, that same velocity curve that I showed you. So normally at six tenths of the depth, but if it's greater than two feet, we do it at 2.2 and 0.8. So where do we do these measurements? The best is a straight reach having uniform flow from bank to bank and a smooth bottom. In other words, that laminar flow that I showed you earlier, well, probably not gonna happen very frequently, but do as best you can. Find the best reach that you can having uniform flow or as close to uniform as possible. Ideally, you would do it where there are no eddies. You know, we, want, we don't want any water flowing upstream. Ideally, we would do it away from the influence of bridges or any other obstructions and always do it concurrent with water quality sampling. Every time we take a stream flow measure, we will need to record water level reading from a staff plate at that station, staff plate. We need to investigate staff plate. Here are staff plates. They're basically rulers that are put in the water. Here's one that's mounted on a bridge piling. Here's one that's mounted on a four by four post. Here's one that's attached to a rock on a post. Here's one that's attached to a tree. So they come in all different kinds, but they're basically rulers, very accurate rulers that are uh, measure the depth of the water. And they come in several different styles. Um, but to read this one, for example, if the uh, if the uh, water level were here, that would be 1.51 feet would be right there. We'll get practice on this in the field. So here's a staff plate that's mounted on a wing wall. That's very typical. And we'll use these readings to construct a rating curve. We'll make many stream flow measurements at one location, and then we'll measure that plot that stream flow against the gauge height or the stage that we read off the staff plate. And so here is a rating curve. Here's the, we measured discharge with our current meter. 
velocity meter. We measure the stage in feet from our staff plate. And here's a measurement, and here's a measurement, and here's one. And basically, if you do a log-log plot, it comes out pretty close to a straight line. But you can interpolate between these uh, because if you have enough readings like this one has, very nicely done. Now, we also have a device that'll help us measure stream flow continuously. Uh, normally, we can't measure flow continuously, but we can measure water pressure continuously. So we correlate water pressure with gauge height. We can measure stream flow and relate that to gauge height using the rating curve that I just showed you before. And then we develop a relation between water pressure and stream flow. Now, uh, this requ requires some additional information. So when we're doing continuous stream flow measurement, we first are doing not stream flow, but water pressure. And this device here is a pressure transducer. It measures water pressure. And, and so by water pressure, I'm talking about the depth of the water over the transducer. Uh, if, the, if the water is two inches deep, there's less pressure on the transducer than if the water is eight inches deep. So this pressure transducer also has a, a memory device that will record the pressure. So we'll have a continuous measurement of water pressure using this pressure transducer. We have one of these set up at all at five of our gauging stations. Now we, we were purchased them through a grant from the Lebanon County Stormwater Consortium. So thank you to those folks, especially Brian Hoffman. So we have those, we have them installed and they are, are uh, each one of our stations look like this. We have a staff plate mounted on the wing wall and we have a pipe going down to the bottom of the creek. And inside the pipe, we have the pressure transducer. And the pressure transducer is mounted such that it goes to the same location every time we put it in the water. We can take it out if we want to, and we can download the data onto our computer, or onto our phone or whatever, but we put it back and it goes to the same spot exactly, same elevation exactly. And uh, this is just a repeat really, except for 2019, we will eventually be able to produce a, a, a hydrograph like this for Snitz Creek or for Bachman Run or for the Quidapahilla at Cleona or wherever we have a gauging station. So remember that we, we can have a relationship between stream flow and the concentration of a contaminant, let's say phosphorus. And if we have a record of stream flow, then we can estimate the concentration of the contaminant in water based on that stream flow and based on this relation. Now, this is a schematic and truly, you won't see a line like this. You'll see a lot of variation around this line, okay? But it'll give us a good estimate of uh, what we need to do to, to uh, estimate the concentration. So we know that stream flow is related to water quality. So if we can measure stream flow continuously, then we would have a pretty good estimation of water quality over time. Now remember, we can't measure stream flow continuously. We can measure pressure continuously, and we can relate that pressure to stream flow because we will have multiple stream flow measurements at each location and we can put the graph together, pressure versus stream flow. And so then using that continuous record of pressure, we can have a manufactured continuous record of stream flow. And so if we remember that load equals concentration times discharge, then we can estimate loads. We can use the daily stream flow values from the hydrograph. We can multiply the concentration associated with the flow and sum that concentration over 365 days. And the result is an estimate of annual loads. So I'm sorry, sum that load over 365 and we get an estimate of annual load. And that's what we hope to be able to do 
it's a lot of steps, but it's certainly possible. We have the equipment to do it and we have the volunteers to do it. Speaking of volunteers, here they are. Uh, and I just got a note from Russ Collins. Russ is really busy with what I believe would be higher level activity. Russ is now uh, on the a national board for Trout Unlimited. And he's been very, very uh, active in landing, uh, submitting and landing funding for the Quittapahilla and uh, Little Creek uh, to the south of the Quitty called Hammer Creek. But we have still have a nice um, a dozen of volunteers. So I think we're in good shape. So for our volunteers, we have several tasks to do. We need to install our stream flow stations, staff plates and pressure trans. Guess what, Gary, we already did this. Thank you. We need to run levels for the stream flow stations. That has not been done. That's not a high priority, but we need to know that that stream flow station is the same elevation year after year after year. We need to conduct stream flow measurements. We'll start doing that tomorrow. We need to collect water quality samples. We are not ready to do that. Uh, we have a lot of the equipment we need, but not all of it. And, and when we collect our water samples, we'll filter some of them, we'll preserve them, deliver them to the DEP lab, and we'll download data from pressure transducers onto our uh, notebook computers, and we'll do the calculations and the graphs that we need. And voila, we'll have a, a wonderful monitoring program for water quality. That's what's ahead for us. It's a lot of work. And my last slide here is a word of caution, stream flow safety in a stream, even small streams can rapidly become too deep or too swift to wade safely. Who here has heard <clears throat> about the flooding in Kentucky? I have. They've had very serious flooding in Kentucky. It can happen anywhere. Uh, even in Death Valley, they had a flood. Death Valley is a desert, isn't it? No, I mean, yes, but they had a flood because they had an inch and a half of rain in a day. And uh, the result was floods in washing away in Death Valley. So basically, if the, swim is, if the stream is too swift, just don't sample, they're not worth it. And by all means, use a waiting staff. Uh, it helps me a lot, and I think it would help most anybody. So thank you, folks, uh, for your attention. I welcome any questions. I went through that really quickly. But uh, if you'd like, uh, I can answer questions. First and I believe off, I, will I will stop the, uh, the recording now, Kent, or should I keep it going with Q&A? I think it's okay to stop it at this point. Okay.